Welcome to our broadcast. Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis died on May 19th. She was 64. She was more than just the emblem of glamour and grace and taste during the 1960s. Both as a public and private person in subsequent decades, she became the face of a new kind of American woman, a working editor and mother protecting her privacy, growing into a kind of beauty that was somehow burnished but not diminished by age. Joining us now to talk about her are these people. Ms. Vincent Astor, philanthropist, author, and friend. Ashton Hawkins, Executive Vice President of the Metropolitan Museum of Art, a colleague and friend. George Plimpton, editor of the Parish Review, who's known Ms. Onassis for more than 30 years. Bill Barry, deputy publisher at Doubleday, who worked with her for the last 15 years. And Jacques Lowe will be with us in a few minutes. He was a personal photographer for President Kennedy and has published three books of his photographs of the two of them. Thank you for coming, all of you. It's good to see each of you here on this moment as we take a note of appreciation of Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis and the life that she's lived and how she became one of the best known people uh, throughout the world, certainly one of the best known American women throughout the world. Uh, Brooke Astor, uh, you knew as a friend and you've, I've met her at your house at dinner. Tell me about her. Uh, and how you thought of her and, and what she was like in these I last years in New York? I in the 70s. I really didn't know her well before that. And then I saw her, we'd lunch together, uh, usually about three or four times during the winter. And then I saw her at other people's houses, or she came to my house. I admired her enormously because she was always herself. And when you consider what she'd been through, I mean, losing her husband, who she loved very much, she had him murdered right beside her. She always, she was never gloomy. She never uh, appeared to be worried to think in the back or say, well, I've had such a terrible time. Because I mean, she, for the minute that one saw her after he died, I always did not know her then, but when I saw her in the television, the way she moved and the way she walked with her children, the dignity of it, and it was really a, 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 a something that only a woman who really is sure of herself, which she is, and she, then, as, as I knew her better, I don't know about anybody who was, could do what she did. She did so much, and she was interested in so many things. You never, she, she was what was known, in, what in my mind, in my old-fashioned way, being a very old lady, I consider a real lady. She knew how to do things, and she never, lost, she never put on an air. She was always, and yet she was always herself. She never tried to pretend to be anything different. And I think the way she brought up her children in the most extraordinary way, without any publicity, she kept them away from that. She knew what a sh nuisance that was if you yeah. once got into it. And she was, as I say, always herself. She was interested in things. She loved her work. I know you've got Mr. Del 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 from Doubleday here. Yeah. And I think that she, that meant a lot to her. She wanted to work aside from just being Mrs. Yeah. Onassis. Let me come to some other things I want to talk to you about, but let me go now to talk about the, the years at Doubleday. How long, you, 15 years you worked years. with her? Tell me about those years and, and about her work as a publisher I and mean, then as an editor. I think at Doubleday, Jackie, Jackie was a person who accomplished a great deal. Um, what she accomplished as an editor was something she could claim as uniquely her own. I think she en what she enjoyed that was different about Doubleday in terms of her most common experience was this was a situation where with a large group of people she could she could be herself she she had an ease and a naturalness um, that was probably rare in her life um, when you say she could be herself what what was that like I mean is there any difference in the person that you knew as a colleague than the person that most of us knew from a distance Jackie's mourned by scores of colleagues at Doubleday. Um, we couldn't help but, but always be reminded of who she was uh, in terms of history. And yet, most of us knew her as a colleague, as, as a grandmother who doted on her grandchildren, um, as a mother, uh, as a person who you would meet uh, sometimes Xeroxing her own uh, catalog sheets, um, uh, pouring a cup of coffee for you from a coffee maker. Uh, and I think these were, these were rare moments um, when she could just uh, just be in an un, undisturbed atmosphere. Why did she choose editing and publishing as the profession that she wanted to enter after um, the divorce from Mr. Nassif? I think her, I, I think her, what she had seen of life was so monumental 
that she was eager to, to bring that to people who would never experience uh, things she experienced firsthand, aspects of history, um, the aesthetic and beauty of, of throughout the globe, uh, the gardens and, and palaces of Versailles, uh, the hermitage in, in Russia. And she felt an obligation, a responsibility, I think, to share that with, with a wide public. I think what, what's ironic is a person who so, who so valued her privacy um, ended up spending a, a long career in a, in a medium that reaches out for, for a very large public. Mm. Ashton. Well, I first uh, met Jackie at uh, the house of some of our trustees, uh, Charlie and Jane Reitzman, and was immediately captivated, as everyone always was, in the early 70s. And trustees of the Metropolitan Museum. Of the right. Metropolitan Museum. And uh, she became involved with the museum initially uh, with our Costume Institute because she was a great friend and supporter of Diana Vreeland, who had come in in the early 70s to run the Institute, put on exhibitions for us of major scale. And Jackie got very involved in that. And in fact, she even uh, edited one of the great catalogs, The Glories of Russian Costume, in 1976, and traveled with Tom Hoving and Diana Vreeland to Russia to help as they chose the costumes for the show. And the show was very interesting and very important because it was the first time people in America had seen uh, the Russian past, the pre-revolutionary past, which had been suppressed since revolutionary times. And this book gave it a great big audience. We'd never had a major catalog like that for an exhibition in the Costume Institute, and that established a new standard, mm -hmm. which we mm -hmm. continued with. The, the following year, she, uh, she did a wonderful essay, which uh, is called uh, a, a Visit with the High Priestess of Vanity Fair, and that was an interview with Diana Vreeland, uh, in connection with an exhibition we did called Vanity Fair. And it's the history of the Costume Institute, but it's also the history of fashion. And Jackie writes a very, very good essay. And then um, she went on working with us in this area, but she also played a very big role in the early 80s as we established the Office of Film and Television. Mm -hmm. And she helped uh, Carl Katz get that going at the museum. It gave it a lot of credibility in the beginning. It was a new venture for the museum. And it led to our making programs over 10 years, many with PBS, mm -hmm. which reached out to a great big audience. Let me come to George, because uh, when you talk about the cultural aspect of her life, I think the thing that I most remember, um, and I was in college during the Kennedy administration, what I most remember was uh, some sense that at the White House, there was, we're going to make this place a home for culture. I mean, I think of, of how Buxalos came there. and. And I, I remember President Kennedy, I think, was quoted as saying, I don't really appreciate Pablo Casals that much, but I know that he deserved to be here, <laughs> something like that. But clearly, she seems to have had that influence, uh, that cultural influence. You have known her and, and, um, and known her friends over a, the whole arc of her life. Uh, reflect on the changes in her, the evolution, how she, uh, you saw her. Well, I suppose it would be a natural uh, evolution. I knew her when she was in her 20s, this immensely charming, uh, beautiful, shy. Before she was married. Before she was married. Yeah. Uh, I, think the, I think the change began, as you say, after, she, um, after the, uh, Kennedy became president. I used to go down to those White House um, galas, not the, the, uh, the intellectual ones, but yeah. the... <laughs> <laughs> these amazing dances that they would they would have there. I think I had about four of them I went to, and they the people drank too much. And uh, I remember Lyndon Johnson uh, falling flat on his back during one of these wild dances <laughs> and leaping up wearing a baby blue um, dinner jacket. I remember. Yeah. Uh, but there were parties in which there was a great deal of tension, but uh, but also the privilege, of course, of being in this um, in this in the White House. And she this this. Um, enchanting uh, hostess for all of all of this and there were high dramas that went on there too um, the Gore Vidal uh, who I think wanted desperately to be in the White House since, since he was by marriage he was what the step um, yeah. whatever and yeah. made the mistake of putting his hand around uh, Jackie's waist and Bobby Kennedy took tremendous exception to this and wrenched it away and uh, big argument, and um, uh, Gore made the mistake of getting into a struggle with Lemoyne Billings, who was a great friend well, of the friend, Kennedys. A close friend of the president's, right? Close friend of the president, and that meant the end of his tenure, so to speak. It wasn't back to the White House. Not back to the White House. So there was all these sort of tensions yeah. going on all the time. I think um, uh, 
it's an odd thing to think. When I think of her, I don't really think of those particularly. Yeah. I, I think of her now in terms of uh, having been fortunate enough to have been uh, a writer with her, an editor. We were having lunch one day, and the evening before, a fireworks show had gone off behind the Metropolitan Museum, which I had organized. <laughs> yes. It was celebrating one of Diana Vreeland's Chinese evenings, I think, and she'd been enchanted by these fireworks and simply said at, at lunch, uh, would you like to do a book on fireworks? And I said, being a great passionate admirer of fireworks, said, of course. And what struck me was how remarkable she was as, as an editor, something that I had not gauged before, really. I should have known better, but she, I found her absolutely remarkable with her sense of just how this book should be done, the layout of it, the pictures of it, her enthusiasm for it. Um, I can't imagine having done anywhere near a good a job with almost any other editor I can think of. She happened to be yeah. exactly the right editor for doing this book. So my admiration for her over the years has increased uh, enormously. She, mm. she, um, uh, not that it wasn't very high at the very yeah. beginning. Well, interesting about the editing, I want to come back to uh, Mr. Barry about that, but you have with you a letter, which if you would, I'd love for you to share with us because uh, you corresponded, uh, and it shows, I think, says something very touching about the person oh, uh, you took the time to write she had you took story. time to write her when you became I, aware I of her wrote illness. her when I heard that she was going to be so sick that she had this thing and uh, I thought well I must write her because I, I won't call her up on the telephone I'll write her so I wrote a letter I don't know what I said in it because I didn't keep the letter of course mm -hmm. and she wrote me back this dear letter and I, I don't know this is very personal do you think it's worthwhile it, I think so if you just to share a, 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 a says, line or two Brooke, how like you to write me such a beautiful letter. It's love, it's love being with you. I love being with you. It makes me so laugh. And the greatest, what do you, I can't read this now. Let me, I can read it. You want me to read it? Yeah, you read it. All right, I'll read it. I yeah. can it. I, what's interesting is I thought this is a reflective of, of someone who, in a moment of, uh, of her own uh, being ill herself, being sick. that she was, I think it was time to write back to you it saying, was she had the most extraordinary manners which sprang from the heart. They weren't anything mm. else. And what's interesting she was about always herself. Mm. Mm. Uh, how like you to write me such a beautiful letter. How true being with you would make me laugh. Uh, the greatest healer. This is your gift. And it goes on to compliment you and to talk about that and just says, uh, I shall look forward to our doing something together in a little while when all this first part is over. Thank you. And so much love, I Jackie. Love fact, she compares me to Mother Teresa. And there is a, <laughs> there is a sense about your own love and joy. Uh, I want to, before we go, Jacques Lowe is here, but go to uh, this clip that we have from the American Experience, the television program on PBS, uh, did a, a multi-part series called The Kennedys. And what you will see now is the wedding of uh, young Senator John Kennedy and uh, then I think 24-year-old or early 20s, uh, Jacqueline here it is. The marriage of John Kennedy and Jacqueline Bouvier was a union of two stars. Joe Kennedy delighted in his elegant, accomplished new daughter-in-law. She had grown up in a world of privilege and pedigree, was fluent in French and Italian. Just 24, she was the inquiring photographer for a Washington newspaper when she met Jack. We'll see a, a, another clip from the American Experience, but Jacques Lowe, thank you for coming, Jacques. It's good to see you. Uh, this is a book that, that you did, uh, which is in print now, JFK Remembered, in a portrait uh, by his personal photographer, and, and we have on still, I'd like to show these pictures and then come back and talk about the subject. Uh, take a look on the monitors here, you'll see uh, a series of pictures of you photographed with family. This was, uh, where was this, John? That was in Hyannisport um, um, after the nomination in uh, 1960. It was, uh, it was a six week between the nomination and the beginning of the campaign on Labor Day where Jack and, uh, probably had his, uh, the only time for the rest of his life of uh, complete uh, relaxation. Next slide. 
that is uh, very difficult to see. I think that is in Georgetown. At the House, he's going off to the Senate. He was still in the Senate at that moment, uh, saying goodbye to everybody. Okay. All right, next slide. This is the back of a car. No, oh. that is a... Uh, oh, that's a diner that's with Virginia campaigning. A, a diner in Oregon, and what's so remarkable about that is that uh, that is about six months before uh, Jackie became a international figure, and of course JFK, um, this is nobody terrific. recognized them. Yeah. They were totally... Oh, the at that time when they were campaigning in West Virginia, it no, was that, that was Oregon. Oh, I'm sorry, Oregon. Yeah, yeah. That was totally West Virginia. That's this Jackie, is a series of portraits I did of her out in Iannisport during the yeah. summer, uh, just right. before the election. Is that is in Paris, uh, at the Elysee Palace, uh, uh, when he said that uh, he was here to accompany his wife. Yeah. Uh, that's, uh, she's descending the steps of the Elysee there. As I remember, de Gaulle was uh, captivated by Totally, yes, because she spoke French, and anybody who spoke French for de Gaulle was <laughs> that's, captivating. That's something special, <laughs> not something he expected from most Americans. Right, yeah. right. What, what, Tom, remember her in, in the, during the White House years when you were there taking the pictures? Um, did you like the camera? Was, uh, well, I, I, was think the access? I think it was a very difficult time for her because uh, she had this um, a great idea of privacy, and um, uh, when you're in the White House, you can't have privacy. Uh, it's, uh, you know, you're surrounded by the press corps. And, and, and also, there were conflicting needs of uh, what the president wanted and what the first lady wanted. I mean, she wanted to have an intimate, personal life, and the president recognized the fact that his two children were a great political asset. Yeah. And would um, use them, not use them, but uh, not be against their being photographed, because it was good, this young family. Uh, a couple of things that I have heard that fascinate me, uh, George and Bill and, and uh, Ash and, and Brooke, was the one that it was, it was Mrs. Anasas that, that, in a sense, was responsible for Camelot, because in one of the conversations, I think, with Teddy White, she talked about how the president loved to listen to Camelot. I guess they had some portable uh, uh, stereo system that he took around to listen to Broadway tunes, in particular like Camelot. Um, the other thing that, that I have, I'm struck by, as we, this note of appreciation, was early on a sense of um, how she wanted to be as a mother and the paramacy of that. Uh, here she was a working mother, uh, working outside of the home. Um, <coughs> Talk about the kids to many of you in terms of how she wanted to this, you know, the difficulty of being a very public person at the same time wanting to make sure that this would be her legacy. Yes. Yes. I, I, I talked to her about that. What would she say? <laughs> well, she, she she just said they I cannot have them. They've got to keep. They've got to be themselves. I mean, never be yourself. You if you start in as a child, yes. having a public life, and I want them to be sure of themselves first of all, because that's what life is most really about. If you know who you are and are not boastful about it, yes. but feel that you know why you are because you're there and you're going to do things. That are and she had that. She was so unassuming, wasn't she? Mm. I mean, she had so much to give, and she gave it. Mm. Because, well, I think in her presence when you were with her, one felt that. I remember a, uh, a publishing party she hosted, coincidentally, in a room at the New York Public Library that the Astor Foundation mm. had, had restored. And as always, she was the light and energy and center mm. of the room. And about 20 minutes into the party, her son John came to join her. And as he made his way across the room, you could see her beaming with pride. And he came up and greeted her and, and, and said as simply as, as any of us would, hi, mom. And she stepped back. And to my eye, it seemed she was just assessing with pride this, this fine son that she had raised. Uh, Caroline and I had traveled uh, down to Washington at one point, And I had come back and just told, uh, told Jackie what a, what a uh, vital, um, self-confident, self-possessed individual she was. And again, you, you could see that enormous pride that a mother Without would take. Without ever being child. overconfident. Exactly. Mm, yeah. A show-off. Yeah. She was never a show-off. She was nurturing by personality. Now, I had the pleasure of being uh, Caroline's escort for her eighth birthday. 
And I always wonder what <laughs> a brain eight? would have... Eighth birthday, and I sat at this little table in the, at 1040 Fifth Avenue with uh, Caroline and I think five of her friends, all her age. Um, yeah. I must have been 42 at that particular <laughs> like that. And we all wore little paper hats. And, Including uh, you, George? I did indeed. In yeah. fact, there's a picture I have that Jackie took. There I am with a sitting with these children looming above them. <laughs> and uh, Jackie sat with the Duke of Marlborough in a corner table and watched the activities of the young people over here. And I remember that I got up to give a toast in uh, Coco. And I said, I'll bet no one here uh, knows why a toast is called a toast. And there was silence, even from the Duke of Marlborough. <laughs> and young John, who was sitting there, who must have been, what, four or something, uh, announced in a loud voice, it's because of the toast. <laughs> and he indeed is right. They, they, people used to put toast in drinks to, to get yeah. the acidity out of it. And although he didn't know it, he had the right answer. <laughs> but I can remember that I, what struck me about it was, was that most mothers, I think, would have said, well, you don't want yeah. that, that fellow around there. He's too old for you, but yeah. not at all. <laughs> Jackie felt it would be very pleasant. I had a wonderful, it was one of the most charming yeah. evenings of my life. Why did she marry Mr. Narcissus? Well, I have a theory. I, I think Jackie w had a sort of a fixation about pirates. Pirates? Pirates. She had a, a, a pirate. I mean, the whole family was full of pirates, wasn't it? I mean, Mr. Bouvier was a ty type of pirate. Uh, kind of a buccaneer? Buccaneer. He, she had in her, That's a better word. In her <laughs> room at uh, Hammersmith Farm, she had these uh, pirate uh, yeah. flag, a skull and crossbones. Yeah. I remember. She told me this one. She once asked me to a, a costume dance and asked if I would come as a pirate. And she gave me a little papier mache sword to stick in my <laughs> belt there. And of course, the. And I did. Of course, yes. I did everything she told me to do. <laughs> <laughs> we all did. Yeah, we yes. all did. Yeah. And I think. Um, and she married a pirate. She married a buccaneer. I think there was something Anasis. about. There was some, you mean, in other words, there was some sense of attraction to, to that, the romanticism of. of well, the buccaneer, the, the buccaneer type, which Onassis was, and I, I, to a certain degree, I suppose the president was. Yeah. Not as much as Onassis. Yes. Uh, you said we all would, meaning that what, in, in for her, certainly because, you know, she was the wife of the assassinated president, after that moment, uh, she always, well, and, and the fact that she handled herself with cer certain, with such dignity meant that there were many that wanted to be there for her if ever she asked. Well, I think that may have been the start of it, but she had assimilated all of that tragedy in her life, and I think by the time I got to know her in the 70s, she was really on her own doing something new. And, uh, and I think the respect that we all had for her was based more on who she was then, even though the aura was, of course, around her. But you were talking about Caroline uh, a minute ago. She worked at the Metropolitan for five yeah. years. And I think she started about 1980 as a volunteer in our film and television area, and then she was so good that a couple of years later we put her on the payroll, and she was producing, by the end, by the time she left, five years later, she was producing some major programs. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember she had lunch with me one day and said, uh, you know, every time I, I get pretty far in a negotiation here on one of these programs, I have to come to you or somebody in your office to get the contract done. And she said, it seems to me that there's something missing here, and maybe I should, a lawyer. Go, maybe, <laughs> maybe I should go to law school. So I encouraged that yeah. very strongly. I said that I thought she had the right mind for it, and I thought she'd learn something from it, even if she didn't go on to practice. Mm -hmm. And uh, she did go to law school, and she did write a very good book. Why was she such a good mother? I mean, back to the point that, that Brooke spoke to. Why was Jacqueline Kennedy and Asa such a good mother? I mean, and I measure being a good mother in part the fact that your kids on the street it's seem to have turned out so well. Inspiring. Yeah. I think she inspired them. Don't you? And some sense of attention and concern. Well, she did. I mean, she made those kids. Uh, I mean, her life. In a, I think to a major passing, degree. With the passing of, she of the president, um, she was the the main anchor, and she knew that they would rely on her as that. The constancy of it, the consistency of it, yeah. the warmth of it. I, I want to reflect for a moment, too, among all of you, about this whole sense of something we might call will and determination and strength, all of those things which you can capture clearly if you look at how she handled herself um, and the sense that she never would do an interview. Uh, and I know that everybody in the business, I never ask it, but I know everybody in the business uh, wanted to. It was the one interview everybody wanted, and I certainly would have wanted it as well. 
but what qualities were there, for better or for worse, that were her essence? Uh, the person, George, that if I'd come up to you over a drink later this evening and say, you know, tell me something that I might be surprised by, not gossip, but just what was it about her uh, that we might not know? You know what I'm asking? Well, you know, I think that it, it, one of the awful tragedies about uh, yesterday is that um, I often wondered if she wouldn't finally one day, <clears throat> she wouldn't, I don't think she would ever would have written about her, her life, but I mean, what an extraordinary life she had and how sad in a way that the rest of us are, are in no way exposed to it. Yeah. Uh, I wrote her a long letter once and I said, look, because she told me a terribly funny story about um, the president and de Gaulle. And uh, I thought, what a marvelous story that is, and isn't it too bad that, uh, that it isn't a matter of, yeah. of uh, public, not public record, but something that historians could latch on to. And I wrote her this long letter, and I said, would it be possible if, if I could come and spend a couple of weeks with you and ask you questions, an interview indeed, but we won't tell anybody we're doing it. It won't be for publication unless you want it to be. It'll be simply a record that you can give to Caroline and John, if nobody else. But there are too, there are too many idea. marvelous stories that you tell that are just going to be lost if you don't get them down somehow. And she wrote back this terribly sweet letter, and she said that she really didn't want to do it. She didn't want, she had a, a phrase that I've, uh, she did not want to sit at a window with an inkwell in front of her and look out. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, of course, I could have written back and said, well, listen, no inkwells are necessary here. It's just a question of having marvelous conversations because she did tell wonderful stories, didn't she, about, the pe about Nehru, yeah. about yeah. the Gaul, yeah. about the people she'd known. And uh, I've often wondered, I, one wonders right today, if she had lived another 10 years, would she have changed her mind about that? Well, I, as far as I, I know, you, yeah. why do you think she might have? Actually? Because I think uh, as you get older in life, you get a greater sense of history and yeah. uh, an obligation to the, to the yeah. future. And I think she had uh, a very literary side to her. We all know that. Um, when George and I, uh, who are both on the nominating committee of the Municipal Art Society, would have lunch with her, she was on that committee. And she loved those meetings. Mm -hmm. She wouldn't come to the full board meetings usually, but she loved the nominating committee because you could talk about everybody in New York <laughs> <laughs> in a very constructive way, of course. Yeah. Um, and uh, she would tell stories there, not, not for attribution, of course. But she was... Uh, they were, she had a sense of the people around New York, a very clear a, sense. An acute observation of, of, of what their foibles yeah. were and what Absolutely. their strengths were and what their weaknesses were. Absolutely, she really did. T you must have, Bill, at some point, had a conversation about why not write your memoirs. I asked her the same question rather directly, as, as George suggested. Um, and her response was very much the same. As an editor, she knew the hard work, the lonely work, of crafting an autobiography. Um, she said that life is too precious. I want to savor it. Um, I'd rather spend my time feeling a galloping horse or, or the, the mist of the ocean up at Martha's Vineyard. Um, and she had a vivaciousness, a lust, a passion for life that, that was compelling. In the end, though, um, she did. I turned the conversation around and I said, you seem to have been a person who has, who has always conducted yourself in terms of a sense of obligation to the burden of history. And at that point, she, she seemed to, to step back from the con conversation as if she was pondering, pondering it. I agree that um, had her life been extended, I think in the end, realizing the unique perspective she had on the world and on events, that she would have, she would have shared that with, uh, with the world. When did she know? I mean, we know that it was four months ago that it, the public acknowledgment was. Any sense of when, how long? She might have known she'd been very sick, George? Well, I do know. Uh, I, uh, Nancy Tuckerman uh, told me that, uh, who was her um, personal aide. Or, right, uh, yeah. Was sort of her spokesperson. Yeah. Spokesperson. She, she told me when I called up when she went into the hospital, and she said, well, you know, it's not really, uh, it's, we're very lucky because she had a full physical in November, and she passed everything. And then, of course, they did all those tests. And then in January, she had the, uh, flu. And I remember at one of our meetings, she was tired and had complained about the, the flu and so mm -hmm. forth, which was in January. And then in February, they discovered this. So it had jumped in in a two-month interval, and, they were, and the doctors were all very pleased because they'd caught this thing so early. 
uh, which gives you a terrible sense of how galloping this, uh, this, this awful thing was. I'm, I'm jumping around here, but I'm doing it on purpose. Uh, Jacques, w remember, I mean, moments you had with her as a photographer and, and whether you had any contact since then? Uh, well, as a photographer, uh, it, it really was uh, the, the early days in the White House. Right. Um, um, I didn't see much of her uh, after that because um, when Bobby was assassinated, I left for Europe, uh, presumably for a year. I stayed for 18 years. I stayed out of the country. I couldn't deal with it. So uh, when I came back, I saw her several times, uh, uh, but I didn't photograph her again. Uh, she didn't really want to be photographed. Uh, um, I think she had done her her yeah. bit as a photographer, as a, as a photographer's model. And uh, in fact, uh, as we approached the White House, as, as the White House became more of a sort of a public duty for her, she retired from taking photographs altogether. But before, she was very open. She was wonderful. Uh, when we first met, uh, she was much more open than, than Jack was. Uh, much more what? Open, uh, because she considered herself a uh, creative person. And I had an empathy with yeah. anyone who was creative. Whereas for uh, the president, uh, it was much more of a uh, historic thing. I mean, he, he was very aware of history, and he wanted it recorded uh, mm. uh, when I was W was she interested in politics? No. None. Definitely not. Uh, in fact, about she later. Was, she was horrified by politics. Yeah. Bill? Ash? I mean, you, you saw her, you work with her, and then you work with her on committees that had to do with the arts and culture. Well, she, she certainly was very involved in historic preservation, yeah. and that's a political yeah. issue and, these yeah, days. And, and, and when it became a political act to demonstrate, to protest, right. to she organize was, oh resistance, yeah. to... She was the first person, I think it was perhaps her first really public political act in 1975 when she went down to Grand Central Station voluntarily. She wasn't mm. summoned by anybody and stood there with Philip Johnson and Brendan Gill and Kent Barwick and the others uh, protesting the demolition of the Grand Central. And when the Supreme Court decision came down a year later validating the New York yeah. preservation law, that really began the preservation movement in this country because so many other cities and states and municipalities, etc., adopted that approach. So she had a big role in this area. Um, I don't think an audience at home knows much. Her longtime companion was Maurice Templeman, right? Correct? Who is he? He's a very wealthy uh, uh, gentleman who's made a great fortune in what? Africa. In Africa. In, in, in Zaire, diamonds. But diamonds, yeah. mines. Uh, I've only met him a couple of times. I, he's utterly charming. Uh, very intelligent. Intelligent. Mm -hmm. I think yeah. they had. And public spirited. Yeah, yeah public spirited. He's the head of the Harvard's. Harvard AIDS Institute uh, and has helped funnel money into that program and he's done a yeah. lot of things for them. When, when you talk about uh, the professional life that she had, what did, um, outside of that and outside of the arts, um, what were her passions? Uh, her children, her work uh, as an editor, her commitment to a cultural life in the country, what else, Brooke? Uh, or Bill? I think it was a horse woman. Horse, she was horse. I forget, that's exactly what I forgot about. He once uh, used the term to refer to her mother-in-law, Rose Kennedy, that she was a thoroughbred. And, and I think that was a term that was, in her vernacular, a, a very high compliment. Mm. She painted, too, you know. And, uh, she was a very lovely, primitive painter. And did some wonderful paintings. Um, she gave that up later. But she did a wonderful picture of Jack returning from the convention, yeah. dressed in a Napoleonic hat, coming in on a boat, and uh, everybody standing on the shore, yeah. uh, applauding. Uh, she did three or four very wonderful, I very think primitive one of the things. things. Extraordinary about her, she never talked about having been the wife of the president and living in the White House. I didn't find that. Did you? No, never. She, she never talked about it to us. No. No. And yeah. she never talked against anybody in the White House or what they were doing. I, I think that was yeah. very interesting. I, I found, and again, perhaps this is uh, what was different about um, the life she had at Doubleday, that she would refer to um, the president and to that time in her life oh, yeah. Yeah. as a chronological event, uh, not to mention an event of history, with an ease and naturalness that I'm sure all of us share with our colleagues and That's friends. That's the stunning thing, though. I, I, I wasn't going to be personal, but I had long lunch with her uh, a year ago. And it was about publishing, but she made a number 
She talked openly, and, and I was deliberately not curious. And God knows I'm curious, if nothing else. And I was deliberately not that. And it was much more of a conversation about things other than my life or her life. But she would easily refer. And she said, you know, this was at the time before the... Um, and she, she was talking about Washington, and she said to me, it doesn't seem that long ago when Jack and I went to Washington. And, and she made no, very, several references to him that I thought, you know, there was a nice, easy reference uh, that struck me as surprising because I didn't know her well. Um, and I, I mean, what, the other thing that I was struck by was, and I, I noticed it actually here, Paul Newman was here earlier for a show, and in the same way, there was a kind of spirit and energy and a kind of vibe vivaciousness and a, a real violent. sense, George, mm. you know what I'm talking about? You know. Oh yeah, I, I think to have a conversation here, I, what always struck me was, was that uh, was how she would never take her eyes off you if no. you were talking no, to gotcha. her. Absolutely, yeah, that's absolutely right. what you're supposed to do, but no one ever does. Yeah. And those great, <laughs> you know, eyes yeah. are very wide set apart, and she yeah. would simply, and then she always had a sort of a, and you would just, you would, well, the famous business about you a deer, deer in the, the glare the of headlights. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, what, and no matter what was, and no you matter how. You felt that you were being so wonderfully interesting. Yeah, that's exactly. right, that's right. <laughs> the capacity to make you think yes. that, that what would, you said was so specially was, fascinating. Yes, that's right, that she yeah. had that. And she would never George. look away if, if someone else came into the room. I mean, I think if a bomb went off, Actually, she would... Actually, yeah. women, yeah. women have... Men see, understand a woman better than other women do, probably. Yeah, yeah. So I, they have much more to say than I have. Yeah. <laughs> well, no, I'm not sure that's true, I, because you've seen a lot and know a lot and knew it probably as well as anyone here. I want to go now to Sandra Van Oka, who's on the telephone. I, Sandra is, I guess, where are you, Sandy? I'm at uh, the First Amendment Center at uh, Vanderbilt University in Nashville. Um, you covered the White House for NBC News and covered the campaigns, and, and you may have heard uh, Brooke Astor is here and Bill Barry and Ashton Hawkins and George Plimpton and Jock Lowe, who you probably knew in the White House as he was running around taking all those photographs. Uh, tell me about uh, the Jacqueline Kennedy Anastas that you knew, both uh, at that time as a reporter and through the years. Well, I first met her uh, during the Wisconsin primary where uh, Senator Kennedy was contesting Senator Hubert Humphrey. And uh, in those days, it was still very much retail politics. The television age hadn't come yeah. upon us yeah. yet. Voter by voter by voter. That's right, shaking the hands. And it was very tough for them uh, in one sense because Hubert Humphrey was considered to be the third uh, senator from uh, West Wisconsin Virginia. because yeah. he was from Minnesota. On the other hand, uh, once Humphrey, after seeing all the Kennedys in there, including Rose Kennedy and the sisters and Teddy and Jackie, he leaned back in a bus, and it's on film somewhere at NBC, and said, my God, I feel like an independent running against a chain. <laughs> and she was very good. And uh, I first met her in a place, uh, Oshkosh, Wisconsin. And um, she was quite dazzling, of course. Uh, she dressed very simply. But... Uh, people out there thought she was quite dazzling yeah. and she uh, went around with him. I don't think she was West Virginia because I think by that time she was pregnant with John Jr. Right. right. I, I, I misspoke and I was thinking, I was thinking about Humphrey and the West Virginia campaign and, and intensity and I, rather than the Wisconsin campaign. One of the things that I think is part of the political lore certainly now is that in the beginning the advisors around then Senator Kennedy did not view her as a campaign asset because they thought for whatever reason, she might not be a great ambassador for somebody who was trying to go around America. And, and it turned out that they were quickly convinced otherwise because of how well she did on the hustlings. Is well, I never heard that, but, you know, it wouldn't have made any difference because Kennedy was his own best advisor yeah. and Robert Kennedy, and the Kennedys did what they wanted to. And I never heard that story before. I thought she was a tremendous that. asset, yeah. J just as the Kennedy family had been... Uh, his sisters and his mother in the campaign of 1952 when he ran against and beat Henry Cabot Lodge yeah. in Massachusetts. And they used all those coffee lunch, all those coffee classes, or whatever yeah. they used to call them. Coffees. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Sandy, did you keep up, did you maintain your friendship with her after uh, the terrible days in Dallas? Uh, just for a bit, when she lived in Washington, if my memory is co correct, the Johnsons were very gracious and stayed there as long as you wanted in the White House. Then I think she moved to the home of Averill and Averill's wife then was Marie Harriman, and yeah. then she moved down the street it was, uh, to uh, Michael Strait's house. And I saw her a couple of times, and then she moved to New York, which I think was a very good thing for her to do, get out of Washington. Yeah. Um, how, in the White House, how did she define the White House at the time? 
define it? Yeah, in other words, what was her stamp on the Kennedy years, other than as a symbol and an emblem of, you know, of elegance and, and culture and uh, style? Well, I think it was all of those things. She redid the White House, and then um, she officiated certain dinners. I remember when uh, Andre Malraux bought the, brought the Mona Lisa over. This is the cultural minister of France. Yes. And it arose because an old Washington hand, Washington Post reporter, Eddie Folliard, asked the Overseas Press Club, asked Mauro uh, in the spring of 61, I think, would you send her to America? The Washington Post sent Eddie over to bring it back, and he wrote about this trip with this lady. Yeah. And then, of course, Jackie speaking excellent French, absolutely uh, bowled over Mauro as later she did with De Gaulle. I think it was just, it was a touch of class. Yes. A touch of class. Had you heard the story that I mentioned about that, that in fact, the, the notion of the Kennedy years as Camelot came from, from her and from, uh, because she, in, in an interview with Teddy White, told the story of how... It was right course. after the assassination at Hyannis, and all she said was he liked to play that Richard Burton, Julie Andrews yeah. uh, record at Camelot. I never heard anybody refer to Camelot. And that was, uh, Teddy didn't invent it, he just wrote it. And then other people invented. I think that other people put their aspirations and dreams into it rather than uh, she put it. And Jack Kennedy would have laughed at it. He never thought it was Camelot. <laughs> what, what did he think it was? <laughs> he thought it was a continuation of, of, of Boston politics. Yeah. Uh, he, had a, he, was a great, he had a great sense of irony. Yeah. And one of his favorite lines was to quote a, a British statesman, right. Lord Morley, at the turn of the yeah. century, who said... Life is one continuous choice between second best. <laughs> and I remember in the interview that uh, George Herman and Bill Lawrence and I did with him after the Cuban Missile Crisis, he said Congress looks a good deal more powerful when you're sitting at this end of Pennsylvania Avenue than it does when you're sitting there. But he never stopped being a Paul. He was a great Paul. Yeah. Sandy, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Great to have you on. Okay. Uh, let me go I now. I, I don't want to disagree with Sandy, but I think continued Irish politics, I think that's not yeah. what Jack Kennedy was all about. Yeah, but at, in, at, at, at his core, I mean, I never knew the president, met him, but never knew him. At his core, he was a politician. He, uh, was, he it, was a very smart politician. All of he that. He was never an Irish politician, even in the early days. He used he, to love he, to have to hear the old, I, I can remember going well, to a dinner. Well, Dave Powers told, you know, endless stories. That, oh, yeah, you know, yeah. you're going through... Uh, oh, we, Dave we, Powers was his great friend. Yeah, I mean, we, we went through terrible riots in, in airplanes, right. through snowstorms yeah. and, and, and rainstorms and, and you yeah. know, on, on uh, yeah. dinky little planes. Yeah. And yeah. He, he would never miss one, and, and Dave would tell Irish wake stories yeah. forever. If and I could follow, follow up on that point, there, but, uh, there was a question I had from a reporter this morning at the BBC, and the question was, how did she help to create the folklore? And the point is, she, she didn't question. create the folklore. The folklore, as, as Mrs. Astor and I were discussing in the green room, was created by by the public by media that that saw the um, the aspects of that story uh, she she didn't to my eye and this is later in her life admittedly but I don't think that was part of yeah. what she devised let me go to this finally uh, and then come back for some uh, for some some closing series of closing remarks uh, this is from the American experience that Kennedy is a series here on public television take a look at this clip in which uh, there's conversation about who she is So she became Jackie Kennedy, something quite apart from Jack Kennedy. Je pense toujours la première à ma rôle de mère et de femme. Es un honor para mí el estar hoy entre un grupo de los hombres más valientes del mundo. And Mr. Kennedy, this is the East Room pretty much as Americans have known it now for 60 years. That's right. This piano was designed by Franklin Roosevelt. And uh, this is the end of the room where Pablo Casals played for us, where we had a portable stage built when we had the Shakespeare players. That voice. That's the sound. Yeah, yeah. The George, talk, tell me about the voice. I mean, that. <laughs> well... <laughs> There I think like. I think the voice was at disadvantage in things like that. She never really could capture the American no. public in those tours of the White House. Somehow it was wrong, but because it's so intimate, it's so it, it's so personal, and somehow um, and one on one it works one -on -one powerfully. Oh, you know, you feel like you're being. Well, <laughs> you don't recognize that <laughs> voice, do you? 
No, well, it, it, as I say, I, it doesn't seem to work. Um, I remember those tours with certain embarrassment and wondering why it was that the voice that so enraptured one when you were <laughs> fast on fast somehow didn't work wow, yeah. with the public. I agree, that doesn't ring true to my experience. Um, that voice. She no, had a it, verve in her voice yeah, that, it, that no. is a powerful memory in my mind. So yeah. lovely voice she had. Um, legacy, Ash? Well, uh, there's a marvelous legacy at the Metropolitan Museum because uh, Jackie told me a wonderful story. Uh, in 1963, uh, President Nasser sent to the president a book of photographs of Nubian monuments in Egypt that were going to be relocated because of the rising waters of Lake Nasser. And one evening after dinner, she and Dick Goodwin leafed through the book, and she chose uh, the Temple of Dandur uh, as the monument that she would like Egypt to give America. And a couple of years later, after she was no longer in the White House, uh, the President uh, Johnson had a competition and uh, it, it was awarded uh, initially to the Smithsonian. And then Brooke Astor over here uh, called up uh, Lady Bird and said, I think this competition should be opened up to other people. And it was. And in due course, uh, the Metropolitan Museum won the competition. And we placed it in the north end of the building with a beautiful glass wall open to the park. And what she liked about it was that she said, it's your largest and maybe one of your finest acquisitions. And I can see it from my living room window. <laughs> Bill Legacy. Um. Uh, she, along with uh, President Kennedy, gave the nation an incredible confidence. She helped the nation mourn a tragic loss. She contributed to the arts in many ways um, and demonstrated herself to be a caring, thoughtful colleague at Doubleday. Mm -hmm. What's your best personal memory? My, first, my uh, best personal memory is a story that uh, a mutual friend uh, of ours had told me, um, Murray McDonald, who lived across from, from Jackie and Peapack. And apparently on, P -Pack on is Easter... Peapack in New Jersey? Or in New Jersey. Jersey. Yeah, right. Uh, on Easter, Easter Sunday, they would have an egg, uh, Easter egg hunt for all the children, and, and Jackie would go over with her own children and subsequently with her grandchildren, and they'd have a big Easter egg hunt for all the children in the neighborhood. And then they were to go up into the attic and don hats, Easter bonnets, for a romp around uh, the McDonald's backyard. And Murray had told me that she was always the most clever. She would get a, uh, a lampshade from the attic and a piece of gross grain ribbon. And she had that, that spontaneity, that, that vivaciousness is the word I keep coming back to, that made her a compelling personality, someone you, you couldn't help but be impressed by, warmed by, and, and wanting to know better. Doc? Well, I uh, frankly think I think that uh, the reason why we are sitting here 35 years after the event is that uh, during those years there was this great hope and youthfulness and positiveness and Americans good, felt good about themselves and they had a kind of a leadership that, that they could believe in and, and Jackie was very much part of that. Uh, yeah, most Americans wouldn't know Pablo Casals as a fell over him, but the, the point is that they admired that this was happening at the White House, <laughs> and, and that was very much Jackie, because the only song that JFK ever knew was Hail to the King, the, the Hail to the Chief. Uh, so it, it, it sh that, that wonderful feeling uh, that has lingered over all these years is still with us. And I think the fact that Jackie uh, became so private after the White House years it 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 remained mm -hmm. uh, because she the people think of her when she was in the White House they they they, they don't think of her in later years really uh, I think that's her legacy and 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 uh, I mean the country is not feeling so good now uh, and I think that you know that is really and hearing you say that reminds me of of I think it was Senator Moynihan at the time George can help me on this who said at the time of the assassination to Mary McGrory, who said, uh, we'll never laugh again. And, or w w and I hope I got this right. And Moynihan said, like that, we'll, yeah. w w we'll laugh again, but we'll never be young again. Mm. Right. right. You know. right. Um, and, and I think it's, it's, I mean, this is the final moment, I yeah. think. It's over. 
You know, it's, somehow. It, uh, this is somehow, you think, in terms of oh, yeah, I think a that passing of... Absolutely. It's, you know, it's, it's George, you're the other journalist it. here. Although she wasn't oh. very much mm. the, the center of the era. She, she was the last... Yeah. Hope. I have a, a particular and very vivid uh, memory. She gave this amazing... Uh, party in, in 1965. It, uh, it was a pirate theme party in, in uh, Again? <laughs> Hammersmith Farm. And she asked me to help her organize it, although it was really very much in her mind. And it was a, it was a paper chase in which the children, and there were 40 children, I think. They were all the Newport friends, their children. And they were to uh, follow these, these paper clues down to a, a hidden pirate treasure. It was a chest. In fact, we went out together and bought this chest. It was interesting to go shopping with her then because she would go into a, a little gift shop and just clear everything out and uh, pearl, fake pearl necklaces and she filled this, uh, this treasure chest and we went down and buried it about, oh, I don't know, 10 yards from the sea and she wanted me to write a little book which described why the uh, chest had been buried there and that the pirates would come back to reclaim it uh, if it were touched. And then she got us, six of us, including Senator Pell from Rhode Island, uh, she got a, a, a long boat from the Coast Guard, dressed us up, dressed us all up as pirates. And she, I remember she painted all of us with mustaches and scars. She loved doing this. She made us into pirates. And uh, on the day of this party, we sat in this longboat around the cove there, and these yeah. children went running around. And when they reached this treasure chest, we came rowing around, shouting, yo, ho, ho, and a bottle of rum, <laughs> and various things like that. Right. Some of the children were petrified, yeah. because they'd heard that the pirates were coming back to reclaim the treasure. And I remember her, her joy in playing this, uh, this, this game and the vitality she put into it. It's an odd memory, but it's one I, I, I treasure. A spirit. Uh, Brooke, um, you've been a friend. You've corresponded. I think uh, that she is a great model of what a woman in public life should be. But I think that her, she's a symbol and, and a, I think an enormous model of what anybody in the White House could, should be. Yeah. And, and some sense of handling herself forever handling with, herself with dignity, with dignity. Uh, and when, also when she was a subject of such, yes. of, uh, you know. And, and not, and she was there and she was behind her husband, but she was not uh, stupid. Everybody knew she was a, a, an intelligent woman then. And then, of course, she was only 34 then. Yeah. She seemed very young to me. Uh, I thank all of you for coming to, to share these memories of, of Jacqueline Kennedy Anathos, who died uh, Thursday night at 10.15. Um, here in New York, in her home, after a, a remarkably short illness, uh, she somehow uh, was one of those people who, when you were near her, either at dinner at Brooke Astor's house or having lunch, uh, felt made you feel like that she was um, vitally interested in what you had to say, perhaps when you didn't deserve to be <laughs> saying anything that was particularly uh, fascinating, uh, a remarkable person, uh, dead here in New York at 64 years old. Uh, I thank again all of you for sharing your memories. We thank you for joining us. We look forward to seeing you next time.